Hi there. Welcome to listeners from across the globe. My name is Allison Nune, and this is Best Damn Reality, a new podcast intending to help bridge the spiritual and material worlds. Each week, I invite you to join me and to suspend all preconceived notions, to open your minds and your hearts to seeing everything from a much vaster perspective. Should you be enticed enough, please also consider visiting me on my YouTube channel and on my business Facebook page, both under the name Allison Nune. Now, sit back, relax, and enjoy the journey. Episode 6, Flexibility in Discipline, is the title of this week's episode. To those of you that have tuned in to any of the first five episodes, thank you very much, and I'm excited to share with you again this week. To anyone for whom this is your first time checking in with Best Damn Reality, we welcome you as well. Whoa, I just need to take, it kind of helps me to take a moment at the beginning of each recording to sort of get myself balanced and to surrender myself to the energy that I am intending to simply serve as a conduit of. If you've been following Best Damn Reality at all for these first five episodes, you know that early on, we talked about one's own greatness and living one's own greatness and how that is synonymous to feeling one's unique calling, what they and they alone in their human vessel came to this planet at this time to be, to live, to do, and how that greatness is essentially the God within us, the one energy of all that is, the universe, the cosmos, the thing that connects all of us. But what's interesting, what's challenging, what what makes the journey just insanely intense and beautiful is remembering that you're that God, that that God energy is you, while simultaneously having the awareness and the understanding that that energy is being transmitted through a very unique vessel in your human personality. So it's, you're both of the, you're both at the same time. At your core, at all of our cores, we're connected and we are expressions of the one energy, call it God, source, the light, the universe, the cosmos, all that is but it is being filtered in this time-space dimension through a human character. And what spiritual awakening essentially is, is learning how to surrender the driver's seat of your human life to that one energy, to God, and allowing it to lead and your human vessel to serve it through choices that are guided by love, guided by your heart. So when I record with you, I am attempting to surrender myself completely to that greater truth, but also knowing that it's coming through my unique human character, known out in the world as Allison. And finding and allowing that balance, making the free will choices as Allison, doing my very best to choose love always, to remember that I am connected to everyone always, to try to find the decisions that serve the greatest number for the greatest good, not forgetting about myself, which has been one of my weaknesses, but absolutely understanding and considering that my actions have ripple effects in my own life, in my own city, in my own country, on this planet, and throughout the cosmos. There are all those layers taking place 
interactions of energetic exchanges at all of those layers simultaneously. Trust me when I tell you, you do not have time or desire to worry about anything or anyone outside of you when you genuinely begin the journey of just simply aligning your human character to that greater energy. Honoring the character that that energy chose to play in this one big human game. You will have your hands full and truly will not care what others are doing outside of you because you can't control that at all anyway. And this crazy time that we are living in right now is without doubt that shift. It is taking place. There's absolutely no doubt. So each week, I'm going to attempt to talk less and less about the material world. We're all super familiar with the material world. We don't need more information on the material world. From my perspective and opinion, what we need is more information coming from that world of the unseen. Coming as raw and open and honest through human vessels. I'm not trying to come as some martyr, some some greater than thou person. I'm attempting to speak to you as an equally valid human being, but who is and has been without doubt living to serve the one and to serve love as my full-time and only job for almost 10 years now. And as such, I can personally attest to the fact that it's a completely different way of engaging in the world than sort of that mainstream paradigm and the very limited way that we had created reality, not just in our country, but on the planet in mass. And last week I alluded to the fact that this, I perceive this without doubt as all part of the divine plan. Eventually, enough human beings would remember this greater truth and the shift of consciousness would naturally take place as a critical mass of energy remembering this truth was reached. And correlated with that has to be the collapse of these limited systems. And as each week passes now here in crazy 2020, it becomes more and more clear that at least on a minimum level, we are going to have some serious rebuilding to do as a culture, as a society. And I absolutely have to be a voice in order to honor my truth. I have to be a voice that speaks to the choice that we can make for a very, very different reality. But in order to, I perceive that I kind of have to speak a little bit as I have been, kind of touch down to where the mainstream energy is at present, which is not particularly positive, not particularly joyful, and getting quote unquote worse by the day. And for myself, I've recognized, okay, I've tapped into that. I've been paying attention now more than I have in the past decade for the past eight weeks or so. And I think I've got enough to now keep going higher and to focus more on my game. But in the meantime, these first 12 episodes, as I've said multiple times, is sort of touching down, is not sort of, It is purposely touching down and sharing real connecting stories to real human beings in real big aspects of our society, at least prior to this COVID-19 insanity. With the understanding and the intent that that is going to have my life experiences and specifically the people with whom I've crossed paths, this is going to reveal a higher potential, a higher reason for why those crossings have happened and as such an opportunity for choices to be made 
to come together and combine our resources and combine our skills and, and intents to serve a very, a much higher purpose, which right now, if I had to guess, I would tell the story that in some way we are going to have to rebuild many, if not all aspects of our society. We've got an economy that has almost completely collapsed, record unemployment, record debt, for the country in trying to handle the record unemployment, record anger, record divisiveness. It's collapsing. It's going to be very, very, very hard to ever get it back. And we don't want to get it back to where it was. It's not about going backwards. It's about progressing, evolving, and expanding forward, higher. And I promise you, I've been preparing for this, for this entire life. And each week, I just have to take a breath, surrender to that higher energy, remind you as the listener that yes, I'm coming to you as a, you know, regular average, just like you, human being, one person, but with a conscious surrendering to something bigger than me and trying to just be the conduit of that. And it's a humbling, humbling experience because in, 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 in a way, I have to be more confident than I've ever been in my ego, in my personality, to be able to hold space for something that still so few people cannot see or feel or even want to believe. To believe that we can have a world without this anger, without this fighting, without this us versus them. To be able to hold space for something that so few can still collectively see, feel, hear, touch, believe in, requires me to have more confidence than I've ever had in this life. But simultaneously, it requires a level of humility when I understand and acknowledge that I am simply trying to serve the light, God. And that is, it brings me to my knees when I think of it. Especially now as I've taken this next step in creating a podcast, which maybe only a handful are listening each week right now. But there is a very good chance that more will be listening soon. And I take great responsibility in that. I'm not trying, no desire to tell anybody what to do. No desire to even debate. But... Definitely serving as a voice to guide people, all of us, wherever you're at, go higher. See more. Assume less. Take our minds and put our hearts in the driver's seat and put those minds of ours in the passenger seat. And with that, I want to read... I haven't, I, I was intending to potentially start the recording with this, but we'll, we're just going to keep flowing and let today's episode be as unique as it's intended to be. Um, a book called Intel Today by a woman named Ilyana Van Sant has played a really, really big role in my journey. Most notably, it was perhaps the connector to my mom and I after having a a very tumultuous relationship pretty much since middle school until my mid-20s. And this book really connected my mom and I. It's a daily devotional. And when she was divorcing my dad for the second time, and when I was going through the divorce from my husband, my, my first and only marriage, we were going through those divorces at the same time. And... I can't remember, to be honest, how this book landed in my lap all those years ago. I think I just found it at a bookstore. But I remember buying a copy and, and, or recommending my mom get a copy. And as we were going through our divorces and some pretty significant healing for us both, individually and then for our relationship, we both were reading this book. And I can't tell you on how many occasions one or both of us would call the other in shock of how a particular date and what, because this isn't based on any year. It's a day, 365 days, 
So there's one reading for every day of the Gregorian calendar year. And it was uncanny how much an individual reading on one day would line up to conversations that my mom and I were having about, again, just about life, just about, you know, healing through the separations from our husbands and all the layers of that, especially, you know, how it's connected. I mean, my own, my own parents and their dynamic clearly set the tone for what I saw and witnessed as my first male, female, mom, dad relationship. It set the tone and understanding through my own divorce and then talking with my mom, healing and understanding decisions made that I couldn't understand before. Well, I'm going to read today's entry. Okay. I'm going to read today's entry and the month of August, each month has a theme and the month of August, the theme is faith. And I find this to be an important theme for these times that we're living through at present in 2020. We are absolutely being called all of us, whatever faith, whatever you believe in, we are being called to surrender to that and to try to imagine the best case scenario during such uncertain times. And August 7th starts as such. Each one for the month starts with this little phrase. I am faith filled and fear free because. So every day in this month starts with that. I am faith filled and fear free because I am diligent. I am patient. I am built for the victory. Bad is not going to leave you alone just because you are a good person. Bad makes its living trying to make you forget about what is good. Bad doesn't care that you go to work on time, give to charitable organizations, and help old ladies across the street. Oh no. What you call bad times, bad experiences, and sometimes bad people are going to find their way into your life. Working its way into the lives of good people is what makes bad so bad. Bad is not going to pass you by because you read self-help books, have an I love you bumper sticker on your car, own a string of prayer beads, or know how to meditate. Get real. Bad is going to show up in any disguise available in an, in an attempt to beat you up, knock you down, run you over, and tear you apart. Good. Show bad that you are made of good. You are made of divine power, infinite wisdom, pure love, and powerfully piercing insight. Show bad that you have unshakable faith and staying power. Demonstrate to bad that you are put together with the unfathomable intelligence of the chief architect of the universe who issued a lifetime warranty on the durability of your goodness. Ward bad off by showing it that you have everything you need whenever you need it to do whatever needs to be done. Demonstrate to bad that you know what to do by doing it. Put on your faith boots. Cover yourself with a faith shawl. Pull out your faith tools and be willing to stand in the faith of good. If you feel a little weary, take a prayer break. Allow yourself to take a meditative pause. Indulge yourself with a deep breath and tune up your faith. Until today, you may have forgotten that you are good enough to withstand anything that you may call bad. Just for today, Flex your faith muscles and shake your good fist in bad's face. Today, I am devoted to showing bad just how good I am. I share that because <laughs> as I read it, it made me feel sort of how, how you feel as an athlete. And today's episode centers around um, the sport of triathlon generally how I landed in the sport of triathlon through an event 
called the St. Anthony's Triathlon, hosted down here in St. Petersburg, Florida, and benefiting St. Anthony's Hospital, which is part of the BayCare Health System, an enormous healthcare system here in the state of Florida. And specifically, a triathlete, a female professional triathlete from Australia named Marinda Carfrey. And before I get into the details of sort of the story about Rennie that I wanted to share, you know, I, as I prepared for today's episode, it, <laughs> it really amazes me the extent to which each of these episodes are connecting to one another and the layers of the connections. Probably, I mean, you'd have to listen really closely as an outsider probably to catch it all, but, but not so much. And I mean, it's there. I've laid out enough things that have already been able to be connected between episodes. And we're only five episodes in here. And I'm, but I can't even believe the way and the extent to the connections because I did not set out to have all the layers that are being unveiled to me, which is pretty amazing. For, For example, example, if we just look at this little connecting example, last week I shared about the role that my ex-father-in-law played in my life, specifically as the role model of role models in terms of creating and handling his business success and his associated wealth and how we integrated that out in the communities through his philanthropy. Well, the divorce from his son led directly to a shift, a significant shift in my relationship with St. Anthony's, the topic of today's episode. And my relationship with St. Anthony's and the folks within St. Anthony's directly led to my opportunity that was extended to me in 2015 with the company of Iron Man, which is the topic of next week's episode, along with Microsoft next week. And then in episode 12, that's entirely going to be about Iron Man. So it's, it really is because I didn't even notice that particular flow from last week to this week to next week until I was preparing for today's recording. So let's jump in a little bit. I think I've already alluded to in previous episodes the extreme challenge I personally faced when I graduated college. I truly did not have a clue what or how to integrate myself in the mainstream world. I knew at some level, not too deep in my consciousness, that I wasn't intended to be part of that mainstream world, but I just didn't see any other options until I started, well, the first time I had to start facing this was at the time of my divorce, which was the very end of 20, 2003. And in early 2004, man, I was at my low, one of the lowest points of my life was early 2004. I'll never be able to prove that this was the case, but I actually, on top of getting divorced and and losing that entire framework for my life, I had been with my ex for nine years, not married for that long, but with him for nine years, my entire, almost my entire decade of my twenties. So I didn't have any other plan. Here I was 28 years old and I lost my job, which arguably I probably only got because of the family into which I was married. It was at the Office of Donor Relations at the University of South Florida. And my ex-in-laws happened to be huge donors at the time to the university. So it wouldn't be surprising to me if I got the job in the first place because of who I was married to. And I'm not suggesting at all that my ex-in-laws or that anybody made a call. I think the call was made by the university. But very interestingly, when I got divorced, my contract was not renewed for that job. So I was already looking at a life reboot that was terrifying to me in leaving my, my relationship of almost a decade. And then I lost my job on top of it. So I was low as low can be. 
And there was really only one friend, interestingly, that most of our friends as a couple were his friends. But there was one woman that I really was going to be upset that, and she worked with my ex-husband. And so I knew, you know, you kind of get custody of friends, right? Like when a divorce happens, people, you know, people kind of stay with one or the other. I think it's rare to find friends that stay with, with both members, no matter how, you know, amicable the divorce or the separation is. This one friend, I really liked this woman. Well, lo and behold, she gives me a call in early April of 2004. My divorce had literally just become finalized in that first week of April of 2004. I had been let go from my job and I think I had a month, maybe two months of severance. So I was still getting paid per se, but I remember each day having the hardest time just getting off of the couch. I had no inspiration. I was low. I was depressed. I did not have a clue how to start over. And this particular woman gives me a call. And she was the head volunteer coordinator for this event called the St. Anthony's Triathlon. Now, the St. Anthony's Triathlon is one of the oldest triathlons in the country. The sport itself is nowhere near as old as some of the other big time sports, you know, baseball, football, soccer, basketball, hockey. Triathlon really is, you know, 40, 40 something years old. Kona, the World Ironman competition is 41 years old. And, you know, that, that sort of was one of the early triathlons that took place, although it wasn't at all formalized when it first took place. And St. Anthony's is one of the oldest Olympic distant triathlons in the country. I had actually done it for the first time as my first triathlon in 2003, which was why this woman was giving me a call. She had been part of volunteer coordinating for lots of different events over the years. In fact, she was the first person to introduce me to the fact that this existed as sort of a side gig out in the world of events you could actually get paid to coordinate volunteers. She had served as being the coordinator. One of her biggest gigs was when the 1994 World World Cup came to Orlando for soccer. Her dad was a referee, and so she was in this world, and she was that was one of her biggest things that she had served as the coordinator for. But she had never served as a coordinator for a triathlon, nor was she personally familiar with the sport which can make the task of managing volunteers that are going to be spread all over the venue, it's a little bit harder of a job if you're not super familiar with the venue and with the flow of the sport for which you're staffing. So she calls me and she's like, look, I am in over my head. If I throw you 500 bucks, will you help me in these final weeks, like the final two weeks leading up to the event? And will you help me on event weekend? And at that point, I'm like, anything to get off the couch. I jumped at the opportunity. And long story short, the next year, I don't remember exactly why they did not invite her back or why she declined the offer. I don't know if the job was offered to her first or not. But in 2005, the offer came to me to be the head volunteer coordinator myself, which then began a 10-year stint where I served as the volunteer coordinator of approximately, you know, 800 to 1,000 volunteers are needed for this event. And then that led to me serving as the volunteer coordinator for for some other smaller gigs in the St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Tampa Bay area. So this became a side gig for me. And the people that operated the St. Anthony's Triathlon, all of them at some point, went to Iron Man as Iron Man began to blow up about 15 years ago, 18 years ago. Iron Man used to only be a licensing, more than anything, a licensing business. And they actually put on only a very few events of their own. And then that shifted In the early 2000s, they started to put on many, many more events and their office of like a dozen people grew dramatically. And a lot of these head people that were high up in Ironman were folks that I met through St. Anthony's over this 10-year period. 
And one in particular has served as my theme, I would say one of my strongest, largest female mentors, not only in the event world, but just, I like to say, just another badass woman out there in the world, you know, badass single woman who, yes, has, like most of us that are out there in the event world, we've got tons of masculine energy running through our veins, but somebody who never lost touch completely with some of her softer feminine aspects of herself and managed to ascend and do really well in the event world. She was just this exceptional role model for me. In fact, so much so that she actually invited me to speak to her team at Iron Man's huge internal conference in February of this year. It was quickly looking like I was going to be able to do a speaking series geared to her mostly female, if not entirely female-based team within Iron Man. And I remember saying at that speech in particular, I don't know how many of the women in the room caught it, but I remember saying, listen, I don't believe in accidents or coincidences. I did not land. This opportunity with Iron Man did not fall in my lap accidentally. And I really believe that there is some way, shape, or form I'm here to balance out the energy, the extremely strong mental and physical energy required in the sport of triathlon with the softer feminine stuff of the emotional and spiritual energy. And now more on that next week and in episode 12. But back to St. Anthony's here. So I end up following into this role of being the volunteer coordinator and involved. And as such, most of it was done from afar. Most of the managing was done online and through emails. But obviously the week of the event, required a great deal on site and event weekend was, you know, really a long weekend. Race day starts usually in the three o'clock hour. At least your alarm is set for the three o'clock hour. And then back in the olden days on the conclusion, Sunday night, the event took place Sunday. And then Sunday night, we used to have sort of a post-race party where a lot of people, a lot of higher ups from the hospital would be invited. All the crew was invited and Oftentimes, professionals, some of the professionals that were racing were also invited to this gathering. Now, being that I was really only on site, I was a contractor. I was only on site for that weekend. So even even after 10 years, I still really didn't know a ton of the people. Definitely didn't know a ton of the higher ups within the hospital itself, I became familiar, of course, with a lot of the crew, but I didn't really follow the sport either. It's a very different sport than what I was used to as a team sport athlete. So I didn't even know who I was sitting next to when this happened. And I'm pretty certain this was 2012 in April, 2012, which was also an interesting year because I had moved to Seattle in 2011 with no intent to ever move back to Florida. And these guys flew me back to work the event, which was pretty shocking to me that they valued me that much to have that not so small, significant extra expense to have to fly me back, especially from Seattle back to Florida. So I'm pretty sure this interaction took place in 2012 because I I definitely wasn't yet familiar with the world of Ironman. I was really hyper-focused on local races in the Tampa Bay area and specifically with St. Anthony's. And now I was living in Seattle with the almost the expectation that I was going to leave this race work stuff behind. Well, 2012 happens and I fly back in April and at the post-race party that night, usually I'm in half a day's anyway because it's you're just so tired by the end of the weekend. And I'm not a big drinker, but I usually have a couple of drinks. I think we usually get two free drinks at that gathering. So, you know, one or two drinks and somebody that doesn't drink very often. And yeah, I can get a little, little loopy pretty quick. And I, I didn't even know who I was sitting next to. And as it turns out, I'm sitting next to as the evening begins here, to the power couple in the triathlon world. Marinda Carfrey, uh, Carfry, uh, a professional Australian triathlete, 
And I don't know that they were married yet, but her significant other is an American professional triathlete named Tim O'Donnell. I had no, no clue that they were professionals at all. Other, I knew they were a beautiful looking couple. I don't even think I necessarily knew that they were a couple. And all of a sudden, I find out quickly through her accent as I introduce myself because we're sitting at this table next to one another, at least for hors d'oeuvres. I don't remember if we stayed next to one another for dinner. I think we did, actually. And, you know, we're one of the early ones there. So as people are starting to settle in, we start just kind of shooting the breeze a little bit. And I hear she's from Australia and I go nuts immediately because Australia has such a profound meaning in my life. And I quickly find out from her that she was late to the sport of triathlon because she was focused and part of the national basketball team. And she's only a few inches taller than me. I think she's like 5'3", and I'm barely 5 feet. I'm not even 5 feet. So to hear her share the story that she was a point guard on the national team for basketball, and it wasn't until she was training for the Nationals that somebody saw her in the gym and suggested she try the sport of triathlon. And wouldn't you know it, she was almost instantly solid as a triathlete and decided very quickly to pursue that sport instead of basketball. And I remember her sharing with me how it was such a change because she was finally able to see even just for herself. It wasn't necessarily to prove anything to anybody outside of herself, but she could finally show herself what she was capable of physically as an athlete in a solo, in a solo field of athletics, you know, a sport that was individual based versus oftentimes being overlooked on the basketball court simply because, one, you're part of five others at any given time, uh, four others at any given time on the court. There's five of you. Two, you know, I can speak from direct experience, too, here as an under five-foot point guard. Yeah, maybe my spastic energy was noticed, but I wasn't ever taken as seriously as a basketball player because I didn't have the physical stature that was associated with high success, particularly high success in that sport. And she experienced this directly and ended up, I mean, Rinny, I think, has won Kona at least three times. Um, And her greatest time, I don't think she's won since 2014. 14, but she is a spectacular uh, triathlete, spectacular triathlete. So again, that story always rings high in my head. I don't know that she would remember it. Probably not. Um, because again, I wouldn't, I didn't even really recognize who she was when I first started talking to her, I was drawn to the fact first that she was Australian and second, quite immediately taken with her story because I personally was a basketball player as well, who, you know, I wouldn't say I consciously made the shift to triathlon. I was seeking something, you know, I really lost my way when I stopped playing basketball. I really lost my way. That was probably my second lowest time in my life was when I gave up my basketball scholarship, no longer had a team of strong women around me, didn't understand what the purpose of being fit and healthy was if it wasn't serving a team and being the best team and being the best athlete I could be. I had a very hard time transitioning all of those aspects of being a high-performing athlete into life after athletics. So this was very inspiring to me. She was very inspiring to me, and I will never forget that interaction. And so it's also really surprising that all these years later, I would have sort of the front row seat that I've had to Rinny and Tim's journey because they've been doing as a couple, uh, you know, I work, I've worked Kona for four years. I've worked a lot of other races where one or both of these folks have been, one of these guys have been racing. And it's, you know, none of that was known to me when I first met her and when I first you know, kind of connected with her at this post-race gathering. Allow me to try to weave this all together here because there are a lot of different angles 
uh, tangents I could go off on and almost do a show in and of themselves on some of these angles, such as the difference between masculine and feminine energy um, and what my experience and observation has been in a very small statured feminine body, especially for most of my life, being surrounded by very masculine energy, especially of the last, I would say, 10 years in my working experience in both Microsoft, Microsoft and Iron Man. Much, many more men than women, and certainly much more masculine, generally speaking, than feminine energy being expressed. And, uh, you know, so I could go off on that tangent. I could go off on the tangent of really analyzing and discussing specifically the difference between an individual sport versus a team sport and really how that interacts with my own feelings and callings right now in my own life, because much like Rini shared with me, it's almost as if I need, I needed to see what I could do on my own in this life, especially once I broke away from the mainstream world and out of those standard jobs, out of those, you know, artificial hierarchies that were within those jobs and begun to make my life simply off of who I am as the unique character known as Alison Nune. Um, and what I've realized is I, I had a lot of sorting out to do. I recently watched um, Jordan Peterson, a uh, Canadian clinical psychologist, interviewed on Joe Rogan. And I had heard about Jordan Peterson, but I had never really let, you know, I haven't read any of his books and I really hadn't listened to him speak. And I watched a whole three hour plus Joe Rogan interview and I was fascinated by Jordan Peterson. Uh, he's been most known in the past few years, most generally identifying with and talking about identity politics, yet another whopper of a relevant issue in our present time. But I bring him up here today simply because a phrase that he used in this particular interview that I watched, um, he was talking about, you got to sort your out. And like I said earlier in this episode, you have your hands full when you actually begin the work of aligning your entire life through and through to love. And like I said a couple, I think two episodes ago, when I suggested the greatest work any of us can be doing right now is to honestly be doing whatever we'd have to do to get to the point where we can sit across from a table with somebody that holds all the opposite opinions of us and genuinely be respectful and, and truly respect them for having the choice to choose that for their own life while you also, and, and, and sharing that being exchanged, this mutual respect and a mutual, you don't have to like it, you don't have to spend time but until you can get, each of us can get to a place where we are loving our most hated enemy, then you are not, then you still got work to do on aligning and doing the inner work that allows for that. And Jordan Peterson talks a little bit about that, not exactly from the same perspective as what I'm going into, but he says, you got to sort yourself out. We need to stop blaming anything externally and, and really just own this is what our life circumstance is. Take responsibility for our lives and start elevating what it means to be individual, responsible, independent thinking human beings and see how a world created with those sorts of human beings looks like versus what our present day craziness has degraded to, I would say, as we witness, you know, the real character of humanity at large facing this tremendous challenge in COVID-19 times. And that segues very nicely because that sort of brings me back to the topic of flexibility in discipline and, you know, really targeting the best aspects of what being an athlete brought to my life. And at the top of that list would have to be discipline. 
I also recently watched The Last Dance, the 10 uh, hour long episodes of the story, the backstory, the behind the scenes story of Michael Jordan and his Chicago Bulls during the 1990s when they won an unprecedented six championships in I think an eight year period and really got to observe Michael Jordan as the leader of that team. And let's be honest, you were going to raise to his level, whether or not you liked it or not. I mean, he was kind of an asshole. He was not necessarily super well liked by all his teammates over those years because he's Michael Jordan. There's no way that guy is not going to, you're going to go and rise. If you're on his team, you ain't doing nothing but rising to his level. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I would argue that we are all being called, our Michael Jordan, if you will, is that higher energy. Calling, again, God, the cosmos, the light. That is calling us, that unknown, all omnipresent, omni, you know, just all powerful energy is calling all of us to step up our game and be better humans. And again, that's going to come when we stop leading, being led by fear, and we instead follow that heart energy. God's in the front seat and God is love. So our heart has to be, our minds need to make this enormous shift of serving our heart. And the discipline as an athlete is something I personally have used tremendously in my spiritual journey in these past 10 years. You must have discipline as you begin to do the inner work. It's essential. But you've got what I learned is you have to be flexible and easier on yourself than I was for so long as an athlete, as an overachiever, as a triple type A personality. So all you out there, you control freaks, you triple type A's, you overachieving all A students, you know, all-star musicians, all-star athletes. One of the greatest things that I had to learn was I had to balance how hard I was on myself. I had to instead focus a little bit more, actually a lot more, on not what was going wrong and all my weaknesses, but instead focusing on what was going right focusing on the strengths and, and I don't even want to say celebrating those. It's more of taking the journey of following that rather than necessarily focusing most of my effort on developing my weaknesses. There's always a balance as an athlete to be certain, but I have found that on my journey, one of the greatest things I had to learn was to be easier and softer on myself. And only I could create my own program, my own disciplined program, and what parts of it could be flexible and what parts of it had to be unmoving. To be honest with you, I'm still in the works of doing this. For years, I've had a list of things that I wanted to do every day as a spiritual routine And trying to integrate that into my world of making money to pay my bills has been, it's taken me years. And one of the most magnificent opportunities that this crazy COVID time is allowing for is that I haven't, I haven't gone, I'm on 10 months, I think, without traveling. I haven't gone 10 months without traveling at least 10 to 15 weeks That's defined my life for the past five years. So having this sort of unbroken time at home has been completely unique for where I am on my spiritual journey. And then simultaneously looking at how the world is shifting in these enormous ways and trying to do as I always do, which is to try to figure out the best way to put myself out into the world to serve the greatest number coming from love for the greatest amount of time. And recognizing these times, we now have an unprecedented opportunity to choose to literally begin recreating everything from a love foundation instead of a fear foundation. To imagine the best story possible 
you know, and, and yes, to some degree, we're kind of in limbo. We're kind of waiting to see things are going to get more crazy. There's no doubt as the election nears, but folks, no matter who wins this election, roughly half of this country is going to be super pissed off given where we are at present. If we're being real, if we're being honest, there's no way to see it any other way. I, there's no way humanity is going to shift that much in three months. So no matter who wins, half the country is going to be livid and arguably at like some networks that I've listened to, some communications, some perceptions and, and takes on our times have suggested there is a not so small part of our population arming themselves for civil war. So we need to wake the heck up right now and recognize it's time to up our game. Not from fear and trying to do it with love when there's so much anger the best way to handle that is, hey, if you're being called to battling, you know, from the anger and, and arming yourselves, by all means, you got to keep doing what's calling you. But once again, I say, I'm trying to be a voice for those out there to put our energy and to understand that simply with our thoughts, if we just simply think about the best most loving scenario that is going to have an effect, a huge effect on what will physically manifest down the very near future here of our linear timeline. And I can't help but apply my athlete side of me in guiding myself first and foremost in this continual process that changes dramatically Every single day, given the nature of things right now, every single day, certainly every week, it's like a, a constant recalibration. And the biggest aspect of me that defines this character, I'm an athlete. I've been an athlete my entire life. And my mental and physical side of myself was overly developed. But just like the rest of the world in mass, for the longest time, until my spiritual awakening almost 10 years ago, I was spiritually anorexic, spiritually super malnourished, and emotionally wounded. I was an adult still running around with all my emotional wounds from my youth. And I would argue that our entire world especially in this country. We are spiritually bankrupt collectively in this country, and we are deeply emotionally wounded. The next big movement that our society needs to have is a massive movement of healing, of healing, of doing inner work, not focusing outside, but going inside. And that's a whole different ball game, completely unique to each character and mostly unseen. It's a completely different world of work, yet that's where my expertise lies. And how interesting is it that this week's episode centered around St. Anthony's? St. Anthony is the saint that helps people find lost things. I would argue the way that I, I guess it's not even argue the way that I would weave that into today's story and to the story at large. My St. Anthony's has been a huge part, continues to be a huge part of my present day story. And everybody involved with St. Anthony's is absolutely in one way or another connected to the world of Iron Man because the world of triathlon is very incestual. It's a very relatively small world, the event world specifically of the world of, tri of triathlon. We all know one another by like one degree. This is not accidental. I said from the moment 
Iron Man landed in my lap. Me, somebody that for the first time in my life was trying to balance out my, my own masculine and feminine energy, lands in this hugely masculine company, smack dab as I had fully dedicated my life to, to more of my softer, feminine, you know, the feminine aspects, compassion, nurturing, more collaboration versus competition. More, you know, sen- sensual and feelings as opposed to logic. More creative and right-brained than logical left-brained. Although I'm very developed in that masculine energy world. But I had to balance out. And the journey of balancing out my masculine and feminine within a world that's so heavily dominated by masculine energy and then to watch now as the world around us is collapsing. I don't even know to what degree Iron Man's going to be present after all of this happens. I don't know if they're even going to survive or how many of the periphery companies that make those events happen, how much, how many of them are going to survive. Our whole livelihood was taken from us immediately. Events were one of the first things that were canceled End of March, we've been out of work. So it is rather than looking and focusing, and if there was ever a collective group that would not let themselves and allow themselves to be victims, but be eager for an opportunity to go back out, whatever that world looks like, whatever our playing field looks like, and to reclaim our power and to go back out and just get it done, whatever that it is, and intuitively, I swear to God, I, I can say it this way. I can absolutely imagine managing one of my Iron Man teams, the ones I've observed as I've idolized and admired the hell out of all the people that I've worked with on the ground, putting forth, managing thousands of people. Managing an insane event triathlon is when you consider we're in the water, we're on the roads with cars. There's, it's, it is a, I mean, there's life and death. We've had deaths at our events. I mean, this is, this is no small undertaking. And I have been in that world observing to the nth degree for five years, wondering why spirit placed me with the path of Iron Man. And I have been doing nothing but imagining how I could integrate more spirit, more of the emotional and spiritual components of a well-rounded person into a highly physical and mental business and company. And I would say that there will be, at minimum, an opportunity for Iron Man to develop into a different type of company Yes, hopefully we still are able to have our sports, triathlons, and marathons because Iron Man also owns the Rock and Roll Marathon Series. I hope to God we can still have those events. But I have been imagining and I have multiple iterations of multiple ideas on how to capitalize on the palpable, insane levels of energy present at any Iron Man event in a way that has a further ripple effect than, from my perception, the energy does at present. When you see what these human beings do with their bodies, it's insane. The men are now breaking eight hours regularly in Kona for their race time. The women, the winner last year, I think her time was eight hours, 40 minutes. The sport of triathlon, interestingly, is almost, ex- it's almost equal in what it pays its females and males, which cannot be claimed, I don't think, for any other professional sport. And these are some very powerful mental and physical beings. They do a 2.4 mile swim in 45 minutes. They bike 112 miles in just over four hours. And they run marathons averaging six minute, six something minute miles after doing the bike and the swim. 
And in Kona, it's hotter in Kona than it is in Florida in the summertime, which I didn't even think was possible. It is insane. And then when you, oh my God, if you step away from the professionals and you look at the amateurs, if you look at the guy that did it last year with two legs that he, he's missing two of his legs or the guy that's missing two legs and one arm and you watch these folks or the 84 year old Japanese man or the 72 year old woman that finishes this feat, there is, there is something I swear not accidental about me being in that world and observing it and what my higher calling is to merge them together. And I truly believe there will be an opportunity. I'm not saying anybody's going to be able to see this, right? But I'm going to do my best to lay it out starting next week when I talk about Iron Man along with my Microsoft experience and certainly in week 12 when I will lay out some of these ideas. And again, this show is about practical application. I'm not just talking words here. This is more than words. This is time to act with more consciousness, with more awareness, and with more understanding that we are really all in this together. And the way we've been living does not demonstrate that we really get what that means. We are going to have to rebuild to some degree, at least parts of our society and our global culture. And I truly believe I've got very practical ideas. And I know my gift to manage, to lead and manage and move a lot of energy, beginning with my own, but certainly I've done it before when I've managed 800 to 1,000 volunteers and I've been observing the best of the best on the ground with these events for five years, just waiting for my time and the opportunity to use my particular gifts and skill sets and to implement it serving something bigger than me. And I think that opportunity lays at all of our feet right now. We truly need to begin to see ourselves as members of the same team and to remember we are being called to our greatness. We are being called to step it up. And we each came here in these bodies, in these personalities to serve a unique role, to look at our experiences, our unique experiences, our unique skill sets. And to take everything that's working well and to focus it and to come together with others, focusing on what's working well and co-create a very different reality. Thanks for listening. We'll chat again next week.